Happy Sabbath, church family. Our favorite Bible verse that I I would like to share with us this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 13 to 14, and it reads, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, a holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isn't it a blessing to receive God's promises directly from him? Uh, Today is indeed a um, honorable day and a delightful day for every one of us as we observe the Lord's Sabbath. Uh, God's holy uh, day. I would like to take this time to welcome each and every one of us uh, this uh, Sabbath. Uh, A special welcome goes out to those of you that are tuning in from home, uh, from the comfort of your home, um, through uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube. Uh, I greet you in the name of the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would like to take this time to greet uh, those that are here for the first time as well. Uh, I may not know your names, but I know the Lord Jesus Christ knows you and knows exactly who you are. And uh, welcome to Glenorchy Church. Um, A special welcome goes out to the whole uh, Glenorchy Church family as well. Uh, Thank you for being here and for being part of uh, the Sabbath today. Uh, Our speaker today is Mr. Ernest. Um, uh, He's not here at the moment, but... uh, I'd like to take this time to welcome you as well, and I hope, hopefully, that he'll join us soon. Um, with those few words of welcome, I'll welcome each, each and every one of you. Thank you. Good morning, Ed. Good morning. Good morning, Ed. Uh, I'd like to invite you all to, to rise and sing two songs with us. The first one is Nearer My God to Thee and I Love You Lord. Please rise.
it's time for our first offering. May we request the deacons to please come forward and collect the offerings. This is for the local budget. Please give generously. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Yes, it's finally working. <laughs> Good morning, church family. Uh, if you are able, can you please bow your heads or kneel as we pray? Thank you. Good morning, Father. We just want to take this time to think of the amazing things you've given us. We want to take this opportunity, Father, to firstly thank you for a new life you've given us to come to church and to praise you. Father, there's, uh, there's a lot of people who couldn't make it here this morning due to different circumstances, but Father, we want to pray for them this morning. We want to pray for friends and families who've lost loved ones. May you please be with them. We want to pray for people who are at hospitals. Please be with them. We want to pray for homeless people. Please be with them. We also want to pray for the Tasmanian community that may you inspire us to share your word and go out there and uh, achieve the great commission which you've promised us to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we also want to thank you for the privilege you've given us, Father, to take the offering this morning. And may you please use the offering to do your will, to inspire people, and to help those that are in need. We also want to thank you, Father, that Jesus, you, you were able to come down and die on the cross for us. We didn't deserve it, but Father, you still did. And Father, most importantly, we want to thank you that you've given us the privilege to come to church and read your word. Please help that whatever and whoever is about to take the sermon this morning, that may we learn to get to know you more and may we learn to understand who you are. Thank you, Father, for everything you've done for us and thank you so much for the families and the friends we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Our second offering is for um, ADRA, stands for um, Adventist Development and Relief Agency. It's a humanitarian program for Seventh day Adventists to help in need. And for those who are following the church service online, you may also um, take part in giving to our e giving app. We'll be, um, the details will be on the screen shortly. But for now, we ask our deacons to please come forward and collect our offerings. Thank you.
Good morning, children. Good morning, children. <laughs> Good morning, church members. Morning. Welcome to Sabbath, uh, church on this beautiful Sabbath day. Boys and girls, our story today is called Buried Treasure. Yeah, and this story comes from Today, Tomorrow and You by Arthur S. Maxwell. Put your hands up, church members, if you ever read Uncle Arthur bedtime stories to your children or had them read to you. Yes. Well, this is a story about buried treasure. From ancient Greece comes a story of a rich farmer who on his deathbed said to his sons, my treasure is buried in my fields. If you want to be rich, dig for it. When the old man died, the two sons, presuming that their father had hidden his money in an iron-bound chest somewhere on his farm, they set about eagerly to find it. What do you think buried tre treasure might be? What? what? A golden skull. A golden skull. Yes, anything else? Money jewellery. Money jewellery. A skeleton. Anyone else? Okay. No, I'll hold it. I'll hold it. Some crowns. Crowns, yes. Golden, yes. All right, we think maybe golden coins and jewels in a precious um, box. Anyway, these two sons were equipped with spades and mattocks and they dug with great enthusiasm and perseverance. We learned about perseverance this morning in our Sabbath school, didn't we? That's right but seemingly without success. Carefully, they turned over the soil in every field, digging to a depth no plough had ever reached, but there was no sign of a treasure chest, not at all. When spring came, the search was abandoned in order that the land might be sown with corn. Then came summer and harvest, what a harvest! The like had never been seen before. In digging the land so thoroughly and turned it over so carefully, the boys had made the land really fertile and uh, all the soil was nice and ready to, to give lots and lots and lots of corn. Um, they had won the riches that they had sought. What sort of riches do you think they got? Do you think they found the buried treasure with the gold coins? What do you think they found? Um, a treasure chest with golden coins and a jewelry crown. <laughs> no, they didn't. This treasure that they found was golden, but it wasn't a treasure chest. It was a fantastic harvest of corn. Can you hold that for me for a sec? Thank you. This is this is corn. This this is corn. The ears of corn. Some people might call it maize. And the whole of the paddocks were full of this. And this is the field as it was growing. And this, they would have had tons and tons and tons of this. And that was riches. It wasn't the riches the boys thought they would get. But do you know what? The wise old father's plan had succeeded because they would have got a lot of money from that harvest and it would have been so much better for them than gold and silver and jewels. Okay. 
Can you show everyone? Pass that around. We too have inherited a precious heirloom that has come down to us through generations. It too is buried, not in a field. Our treasure is not buried in a field. It is buried in a... No? In a book. Think about it. It's in a book. And God gave it to us. And he said, if you would be rich in all the best and most beautiful things life has to offer, search this book. Griffin. Griffin. Sit here, please. Okay, so we've been told to search this book to find all these treasures. We can dig into it with all the spiritual tools at our command. We can read it, study it, meditate upon it, pray over it, and we will find the richest of treasures. This book is, of course, the, the Bible. Can you see my Bible? My Bible. <laughs> Are you going to hold it up? Okay. Most of you here today have probably got your hand on your Bible or your Bible is close to you, ready to be opened to, to search for the riches. Um, it's, the Bible is a, a lot like some books but it's so much better. Come sit down, please. Griffin, sit down. Sit. Sit down. Good boy. Thank you. Okay. Just. All right. When we open our Bibles, we get the first glint of treasure, don't we? And we can soon see it. When we open our Bibles at the beginning, we can see the whole story of creation and God's love for us. And as we go through the Bible, we, we find other treasures and gems that are for, for us to reap a harvest of spiritual blessings, which is peace, strength, um, spirit of the spirit, yes. love, love, joy. love, what else? Love is kind, kind and patience. <laughs> well done. Yes, love. Uh, be kind to others and be kind and eat fruit so you don't get sick. That's, that's right. And you have to be loving to other people on earth. Exactly. And also you make sure you don't be near others when you are sick. Exactly. Thank you, Griffin. <laughs> Well, the Bible shows us how to love because it's a whole story of love, isn't it? God's love for us and his plan for us. And this is treasure worth digging for. You know, this, these treasures that we have in these um, treasure chests, they fade away. They're worthless. We can't take those to heaven, can we? We can't take any of our material things to heaven with us, but we can take the treasures that we dig up from the Bible to heaven with us. And we will see the master plan that God has provided for us. And it's available to all of us. It's not just available to some people. It's available to all. Sorry. Thank you. And what a treasure this is. And what a pity to have it in your home and not look at it. So when we go home, we're going to look at our Bibles and we're going to read it and we're going to dig into it to look for the treasures. To be poor when we might be rich. To be weak when we might be strong. To be sad and de dejected when we might be radiant with joy. Believe me when I say that this treasure is very close to you. You even may be touching it at this moment. It is in your Bible. Thank you, boys and girls. You may go back to your seats.
speaker here. <laughs>
um, which I could give you plenty of evidence for. But how do you think Alan White handled it in the middle of this debate? This is what she said. I felt deeply moved by the Spirit of the Lord Sabbath afternoon, October 13, so this is the first Sabbath few days into the Ministerial Institute, to call the minds of those present to the love God manifests to his people. The mind must not be permitted to dwell on the most objectionable features of our faith. In God's word, which may be represented as a garden filled with roses and lilies and pinks, we may pluck by faith the precious promises of God. Appropriate them to your own hearts. Be of good courage, yes, joyful in God. Or we may keep our attention fastened on the briars and thistles and wound ourselves severely and bemoan our hard lot. God is not pleased to have his people hanging dark and painful pictures in memory's hall. He would have every soul plucking the roses, the lilies and the pinks with the precious promises of God. And so she goes on. So... In all of this going backwards and forwards and people saying what Alan White was supposed to have said or not, she tried to lift people's minds above that, away from personalities, away from the discussion and said, concentrate on the promises of God. They are the roses, the lilies and the pinks. Pinks were dianthus, carnations, okay? She loved her flower garden. That's the illustration that she used at that time. So let's, for a few moments this morning, concentrate on some of these positive things. The roses, the lilies and the pinks. Let's look at a few of God's promises today. Pluck by faith, we're encouraged. The precious promises of God. Doesn't a promise sound a lot better than some of the stuff I was just telling you? <laughs> Precious promises of God. Well, God, when you have the picture of God, the picture we can have is he's faithful, powerful, gracious and giving, which I've got written down here, and he loves to make promises to us. How many promises do we find in the Bible? Well, this is the most comprehensive book I've ever seen about the promises in the Bible. Right, and in this book, the writer, he said, uh, he was looking for some promises and couldn't find books on the promises. He finally found one that had been printed 130 years before this one. So then he thought, well, let's, uh, let's find out. And in his introduction of this book, he says this. He picks up a story of a school teacher by the name of Everett Storms. And uh, on, during his 27th reading of the Bible... This devout student tried to tally up the promises, a task which took him a year and a half. Storms came up with 7,487 promises by God to man, two by God the Father to God the Son, 991 of one man to another, such as the servants in the King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, 290 by man to God, 21 promises um, were made by angels, one by man to an angel, and two were made by an evil spirit to the Lord. Satan made nine, as when he promised the world to Christ, if he'd fall down and worship him, and storms finally came up with a grand total of 8,810 promises. Now, on top of that, we can uh, maybe look at the prophecies of promises, so you could add them, and uh, also the covenants... Uh, you could also add those in as well. So that's a fair few promises, isn't it? When we look at the promises in the Bible, they come in a variety of forms. There are conditional ones and unconditional. You got the idea? Conditional, if, then, okay, and unconditional. And then there are, I don't know, what would you think of God saying... Jonah, you go and tell Nineveh in 40 days you are going to be destroyed. Is that a conditional or an unconditional promise of God? That will happen. It sounds like that will happen, doesn't it? That's right. But did it happen? No, it didn't happen. So was it that conditional or unconditional? 
All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, if you read Ezekiel 33, 14 to 16, you'll find that God is a loving, merciful and forgiving God and because the people of Nineveh repented, then he overturned what he said would happen. All right. So there's generally conditional, unconditional. What's a... Uh, What's a, an unconditional one? I've just uh, got here in Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. When you see a rainbow in the sky, is that conditional or unconditional? Promise of God? That's a condition, that's an unconditional one that God is not going to send a flood to flood the earth again. All right, but verse 22 of Genesis 8, it says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. That's an unconditional promise of God. All right, the cycles will continue. And then he made promises that were given to individuals and also to groups. He might have made a promise to Adam or Noah or Abraham or to groups, Israel, the Christian church, Gentiles, all people. All right, this text for all of these. And then there's a most important promise that continued as a thread right through scriptures and that was the coming of Jesus, the coming of a Messiah. And does any text jump into your mind as a promise of God about a Messiah or Jesus coming? Genesis 3.15, yes, thank you. All right, um, Isaiah 7.14 is repeated in Matthew 1.23 and someone would come who was Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, that's a prediction and a promise. And so it goes on. And then there are promises in the Bible that God has kept to you. And also there are present promises for us to live with each day and there are future promises. Maybe we'll just um, give a couple of moments. Would somebody like to give a little maybe brief story of a promise that God has kept to you? So what was the promise and how did he keep it? Anybody like to share a little story of a promise that God has made and he's kept to you? Right. Uh, yes. Thank you, Daniel. Giving and stewardship. Oh. oh, hello. Yeah. Just in terms of giving and stewardship, just that uh, that you know God will take care of you if you're faithful in that area. I've experienced that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thank yeah. you. One more. Okay. I'm sure there are many promises He's made. Um, God gives us life. To see you all sitting in the pews here, God's kept a promise, hasn't he? <laughs> all right. So then there are uh, present and future promises, which brings me to John Loughborough. Uh, John Loughborough, um, we were privileged to have as a guest speaker at a camp here in Moona, in uh, Tasmania here on the 26th, uh, was it the 26th? of December 1908 and so I have in the record um, how wonderful it was that they were happy to welcome this man who was one of the original pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and uh, they make the comments here that it was a bit of a tense time in Tasmanian history because the the Tasmanian Parliament had just start, passed a bill to regulate Sunday observance and there were Adventists in Tasmania who ran into that. Elaine was from Glen Hewen. I have stories from down there where they, people working on their farms on Sunday were fined um, uh, for breaking the Sunday law in the state. And that happened uh, a, a few times down here. So people were praying hard about the government regulating the way people observe today. All right, if you didn't keep Sunday. All right, but John Loughborough, it says here, as usual, gave his studies on the early experiences and the development of the message up to the present time. They were listened to with marked interest and were a source of encouragement to our people. So, um, yeah, there's a, a story to tell here, but the, one of his Bibles, when he died, they found in it this. 
He finally died at 92 years of age. He had read his Bible through at least 70 times and in the flyleaf of one of his Bibles were these words. In the Old Testament, the 2,253 promises for the present. In the Old Testament are 791 promises for the future. In the New Testament, there are 274 promises for the present. And in the New Testament, 2,573 promises for the future. That makes up 5,891 promises in the Bible. So these, just John Loughborough added these up in, uh, over time and that's what he came up with as the promises for the present and the future. So maybe you can help me today, all right, um, or maybe just, to, maybe just to lead up to this, let's just have another look at a thought of Alan White. All right, uh, 1904, Signs of the Times, July 27. And it's a little bit like her other quote. I'll just give you this context of when this was written. This was written at a time when, once again, there was tension in the Adventist church. Um, we find here that uh, John Harvey Kellogg, who was a world-famous doctor by this time in his day, Adventist, head of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, was wanting to build a bigger sanitarium and he was wanting to do fundraising by selling a book called The Living Temple. I had a copy of this uh, for some years, I left it at Avondale Archives. But in it, Ellen White indicated that she was not agreed with it. I've read most of, a, lot, a lot of it, it was pretty good stuff on health. But early in the piece, he brought out ideas which we call pantheism today. Now, pantheism is the belief that God just didn't create things. Pantheism is that God is in things. All right, God is in the wood of this pulpit, okay? God is in the orchids over there, all right? God is in it. He is not the creator of it. So... I think Kellogg was trying to say how wonderful creation was, but he went overboard with it. And so there was a crisis at the time, and lo and behold, what did Alan White say? To try and balance this out was, not only did she not agree with it, but this article, it's all there, uh, you can find it. He has filled his word with wonderful promises to strengthen and cheer his children. In these promises, he draws back the veil from eternity and gives us glimpses of the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Along the pathway, God places the fair flowers of promise. And so she then says what those promises will do for us, bring us joy, give us the hope of mansions, light, strength, refreshment, encouragement, comfort, support. Yeah, all sorts of here, peace, Okay, uh, the angels helping, a uh, sure foundation for God so loved the world, John 3.16, so it goes on. So in the face of this crisis that could have rocked the Adventist church, pulling pantheism into it, what, did, what was the advice once again? Hang on to the promises of God. Hang on to the promises. So I'm wondering if you can help me with some of these promises today. This is an instantly created blackboard. <laughs> okay. This is out of the primary junior jet Sabbath school. So just imagine you're a young person now and you are thinking of the promises of God. All right. I'd like you to help me find promises of God that help you in the present. All right. I've got some categories here that I, uh, I worked out, all right? Some categories of where there are promises for the present. So what do you, can anybody help us with some promises for the present? You've got uh, 
what, five, six, eight thousand promises, so I reckon you should be able to give us some. Any, uh, I'll write down one for each point because my blackboard isn't very big. But uh, who has a promise for the present? Thank you. Not something. Um, for saving and forgiving, or I don't know if, if that's two different ones or two separate ones, but at least forgiving, forgiving is First John one nine. Uh, All right, First John one nine. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Very good. Thank you very much. Yep. Another promise. Uh, did I hear one mentioned down the front here? Right. Um, what would that be to you, uh, Eddie? A preservation, maybe? All right. What's, your, what's our text again? All right, somebody help Eddie with that. I haven't got room to write the text up. I'll just write the reference. All right, so uh, come back to that. All right, anybody else? Uh, do you have a... I promise up here, thank you. Saving, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that if we believe, we'll be saved. Yeah, that's a good promise. Okay, for God so loved the world. Yeah, if we believe, we'll not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, for comforting, 1 Peter 5.7, cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Right, First Peter 5, 7, thank you. Oh, my heart's feeling a bit warmer already. Yes, thank you, Colin. What's your promise? Uh, and the text? Um, this, this one is for peace. Peace? Uh, Psalm 139, 17 and 18. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Yep, yeah, okay, excellent, thank you. What's another piece one while we're on the ball? John 14, 27, Jesus offers what? Peace that's far deeper and longer lasting than any peace the world can offer, yep, yeah, okay. Uh, Courage. Jill? Uh, sorry, yes, thank you. Courage, Psalm 40, verse 1. Psalm? Psalm 40. 14. 40. 40, Psalm yes. 40 and verse, verse 1. 1 yes. And what's that about? Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, while you're getting some help on that, let's have another promise. Yes, Jim. <laughs> Revelation 21, 1 to 7. That's... Um, I'm going to come to future promises in a minute. Can you bring that up, one up again? All right, we're just looking for promises for the present. Have you got a promise? Surely each one of you, I would hope. You know, when people are feeling depressed and all that sort of thing, I say, go to the Bible. Find some Bible promises to encourage your heart. All right, hang on to the promises of God. He Keep his promises. He won't let you down. I have... Yep. Uh, we'll just come back here. Have we got the words of Psalm 40 and verse 1? No. Okay. All right, we'll go for this one. I've got Mr. Littlewood joining us um, through the live stream, and he said Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, and that's under the guiding category. All right, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, yes. Okay, thank you. We've now got our solution down here. Psalms 40 verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cries. He lifted me out of the pit of despair and out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked alone. Does that fit the uplifting one? When we don't feel we're on solid ground? Yep. Okay. Psalm 40 and verse 1. Not, yep. Thanks. Isaiah 41.10, what was that about? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So where does that fit? 
Maybe here. No. Uplifting, giving hope, deliverance, everything. All right. Uh, Isaiah 41. 41 10. 10. Yep. Yes, Elizabeth's got one. No. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Patrick? Yep, thanks. Psalm 23, verse uh, uh, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yeah, excellent. That's good to know. It, the the uh, old translation says, they'll walk the valley of shadow of death. The Hebrew says, they'll walk through dark and shadowy valleys. All right, it doesn't have to be a deathly one, <laughs> but you might go through dark valleys and you can know your shepherd is with you. Yep. Yes, okay, thank you. I've got one for courage. So Job 11, 18, it says, Having hope will give you courage. You will be protected and will rest in safety. Right, so did, uh, did Job need any encouragement? <laughs> Certainly did, didn't he? Okay, and... Uh, what amazed me in the story of Job was the end, wasn't it? When he forgave his friends, God healed him. It's interesting, isn't it? He was having a big, big, big problem there because his three friends were giving him bad advice. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I got one in Romans 15 verse 13. It says that, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What's our text again? Romans 15 verse 13. Which one does that fit? Um, uh, I personally think that will go giving hope. All right. Romans? Romans 15 verse 13. Yeah, that's a good one. Excellent. Uh, how's our time going? Let's, uh, let's see. Uh, what ones don't we have... Yet, uh, temptation. What's the temptation one? He won't allow us to be tempted above that which we're able to bear. What's that one? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That's that one. Yep. Okay. Any others? What about deliverance? Uh, any? The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Where do we find that one? Psalm 34, 7. Uh, sorry? Matthew 11, Matthew 11, 28 for rest. Yes. And what does that say, uh, Wes? Yeah, come to me and all who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Yeah, that's a good promise, isn't it? Okay. Uh, sustenance. Physical sustenance. Anything about that in the Bible? Isaiah 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. It's a nice one for mums, isn't it? Isaiah 40, 11. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes, I have that marked in my Bible when I'm visiting people. Yep. Psalm 32, 7. me from trouble you sh shall surround me with songs of deliverance so okay that's excellent good. that's a good one too um how about sustenance matthew 6 does that help us matthew 6 does that give you a clue all right consider the lilies of the field what about the birds of the air all right does god care for us more than these What's he say? Take, don't worry about tomorrow. All right? God will help us. Matthew 6, what? Just, 33. Just another one for that one. 
Um, Bruce, we've got Malachi 3, uh, 10 to 12. It says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there might be food in my house, and test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not be room enough to store it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops, and vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, there's, there's many promises. So if you haven't been able to think of a promise, write down one of these. Okay. Otherwise, remember the Bible. Somebody said there were 30,000 promises in the Bible, but then somebody figured that's probably about how many lines are in the Bible. Anyway, <laughs> so that's saying the Bible's full of promises. But no, uh, there's what, 5,000, there's 8,000, whatever you... Uh, can dig out there. We've just had a look at a few here in the present, all right, of the promises of God. All right, so when we think of God keeping his promises in the present, no matter what circumstances we're going down or through, hang on to the promises. Charles Swindle made this comment, God's book is a veritable storehouse of promises, not empty hopes and dreams, not just nice sounding eloquently worded thoughts that make you feel warm all over but promises verbal guarantees in writing signed by the creator himself unlike the rhetoric of politicians which we hear a lot of who promise anybody anything they hear to get elected what god says he does all right the promises of god now there are was brought up here there are promises we mightn't see now but there are eternal promises there are future promises and what was that one jill revelation 21 which was all about new jerusalem the new jerusalem the wonderful things god's got prefer you wipe away all tears and all sorrow and crying that's right they're promises that we can hang on to all right, when we've had personal losses, that's for sure. Okay, um, any other prom- future promises that Jesus made? What's a future promise that Jesus made? That's right, he's promised to return again. That's right, if I go away, I promise I'm coming back again. Second Peter 3, 4 and 5, Titus 2, 13, we call it the blessed hope, Daniel 12, 1 to 3. And what comes with the second coming of Jesus? Eternal life, the resurrection, isn't it? Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. And, uh, and this year, it uh, is 50 years since my mum died when I was a teenager. And I didn't like God for a while because he took my mother. All right, but then I came to believe the Bible promises that we could meet again okay i did talk to my sister about this and she had put it in the back of her mind because my mum died on her birthday so she said for 10 years whenever my birthday happened i would not celebrate it okay so we've got to hang on to the promises of god the resurrection promises and eternal life as was mentioned over here john 1028 and so we could uh, yes yeah, see the end of death and part of that thing in revelation 21 is what the tree of life the water of life all right uh that's right john 14 if i go i'll make mansions or homes for you and the classic one we think about first corinthians 2 9 Eye has not seen or ear heard or has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has got prepared for us, both in the way of salvation and the future. So how do we get hold of these promises? How do we get hold of God's promises? They're there for us, right? How do we personally get them? Believe them. That's by faith, yeah, trusting God, Hebrews 11. All right, uh, 33 and verse 6. Here we live by faith. We accept the gift, don't we? What's Romans 6, 23 tell us? Why is sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, um, we get them through the Holy Spirit, don't we? 
Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 tells us, or John 14 tells us, he gives a comforter to help us. And 1, 13 and 14 in Ephesians tells us that we are sealed with this Holy Spirit of promise. So we can be confident as we live life in the hand of God because we've got the Holy Spirit's guide. By prayer we can get it. We can wait patiently on the Lord. We can respond and do the will of God that allows him to work out those promises. All right, there's a variety of texts I've got here. We can trust the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right, hang on to that. It can grow. And uh, Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews 10.23. All right, let's just make this the last one here. Hebrews 10.23 Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So when your faith is tested, when your experience is tested, remember God is faithful. A minister in, uh, in Texas in America had done, he had a radio program that is... His uh, sermons were beamed out on and he talked about um, one day standing on the promises and a Vietnam vet uh, wrote into him and this is what he said. I tuned into your service and uh, he wrote an appreciation. He said, you sang the hymn Standing on the Promises. I love that hymn. During the war I stepped on a landmine and I lost both of my legs. Now the promises of God are the only things that I can stand on, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises is the last hymn that we'll use. It was written by Russell Kelso in 1886. When he was 30 years of age, he developed heart problems. All right, and uh, he didn't think he'd make it through. And while he was in the down of that experience, suffering with his heart problems, he he read the promises. They encouraged his heart. Uh, well, encouraged his heart physically and spiritually. <laughs> All right. He did live years future in advance, but in the process he wrote this hymn, which our song group has not practised, but those of you who know it of the group, come up the front here and sing Standing on the Promises of God as we all share in together to conclude our services today. Thank you, Bruce, for standing in um, for our speaker that for some reason has not turned up and we do pray that everything's okay. Why he's not here, only God knows. And uh, as he said, we're going to sing Standing on the Promises, hymn number 518. Thank you.
Heavenly Father, when we have looked at some of these stories and the setting of scripture for some of these, in fact, today, when we're going through maybe personal differences with people, or whether it's theological issues, or just wondering uh, which direction to turn if we're depressed or feeling down, we do thank you that there's thousands of promises that we can hang on to. We can lift our eyes up. We don't have to just settle with all of these other things. And once again today, we do thank you for all of these promises. I pray that each of us has got a favourite promise that uh, we can keep close to our hearts, whether it's thanking God for an answered prayer in a promise, whether it's a promise that we need each day now, or whether it's a future one that we need to look forward to, to encourage our hearts. Thank you for these, as we're encouraged to pick the roses, the lilies and the pinks. And once again today, we do thank you for your acceptance of us as your children, that we can enjoy our salvation in you. And so may it be that the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen.